Hi everyone and welcome back to the channel. In the last video I broke down Terence Howard's claim about solving the three-body problem and explained why it doesn't really hold up. I also promised to show you what the actual solution looks like and that's exactly what we'll be exploring today. Before we dive in, I just want to make a few quick remarks about the previous video. There were some really interesting comments and I really appreciate everyone who took the time to share their thoughts. In particular, I want to give a special thanks to Al Bouli for pointing out the mistake I made. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Let's replay that part for a quick refresher. The mistake I'm referring to was in the part of the video where I tried to demonstrate sensitivity to initial conditions by changing one of the velocity components by 0.1 and calling it a slight change. But that's actually not a slight change at all. If the velocities are roughly 1 in magnitude, then a change of 0.1 amounts to a 10% difference, which is quite significant and not just slight. As Al Bouli pointed out, a truly slight change would be something more like 0.0% or even smaller. I also realized afterward that using the figure 8 solution to demonstrate sensitivity to initial conditions wasn't the best choice. That particular solution is known to be unusually stable for a three-body system, which kind of defeats the purpose of the demonstration. So I want to fix that now. To really appreciate what sensitivity to initial condition means, let's take a look at this new example. Now these two values differ in the sixth decimal place. Now let's take a look at how the solution will change. They start off the same, but as the time passes, their motion changes in noticeably different ways. And this is the essence of chaos. Tiny changes in initial conditions get amplified over time, leading to completely different trajectories. Another point I'd like to add to what I said in a previous video. It's about the general solution to the three-body problem. I mentioned that there is no closed-form solution meaning we can't express the general solution using a finite number of standard mathematical operations. But interestingly, in 1912, Finnish mathematician Carl Sandman showed that the analytic solution does exist. It's just not in a closed form. Instead, it's given as an infinite power series, specifically involving powers of the cube root of t. But the series Sandman derived converges extremely slowly. So slowly, in fact, that reaching a value with meaningful precision would require an enormous number of terms. This makes the solution practically unusable for real-world applications. In fact, in 1930, David Beloritsky estimated that applying Sandman's series to astronomical calculations would require at least 108 million terms. Because of this impracticality, the three-body problem is still considered unsolved in terms of a usable general solution. And finally, the last point I'd like to add to my critique of Terence Howard's document is this. His approach attempts to solve the three-body problem by constraining the motion of the three bodies using what he calls linchpin geometry, Howard comma corrections, whatever that's supposed to mean. In the previous video, I showed that the math behind this is essentially nonsense. But even if we pretend for a while that the math is somehow correct, his document still wouldn't count as a solution to the three-body problem. Because by artificially constraining the motion of the bodies, you are fundamentally changing the physics of the system. You are no longer solving the original problem, you are solving a different one entirely. It's something like this. Imagine you are playing chess, but you are overwhelmed because there are too many possible moves. So you say, I've got it, let's just fix the queen and knight so that they can't move. Sure, now the game is simpler. There are fewer variables, fewer options. But at that point, you are no longer playing chess, you are playing something else. And that's exactly what's happening here. If you restrict how the three bodies can move, you are not solving the three-body problem anymore. And honestly, it seems like the authors don't actually understand what the problem in the three-body problem really is. The issue with the three-body problem isn't that the motion is chaotic and we just don't know how to stabilize it. Chaos is an inherent feature of the system. You can't remove it, because that's simply how nature works. The real challenge is that there is no general closed form solution, no single neat formula built from a finite combination of standard mathematical operations that can predict the motion of the three bodies for all possible initial conditions. That said, the absence of the closed form solution doesn't mean we are clueless about what happens. We can compute it, either by using Sandman's analytic solution, which expresses the motion as an infinite power series, which is mathematically valid, but utterly impractical in real-world applications, or by using numerical methods. The latter works well in the short term, but over long time scales, the results still become unpredictable because of the system's sensitivity to tiny changes in initial conditions. All right, let's now get back to the main topic of this video. 
We'll start with a quick review of what a three-body problem is. Then I will derive the equations of motion for the three bodies. And finally, in the third and last part, we will look at how we can actually solve it numerically. Now things will get a bit more technical in that final section, but I will do my best to keep the explanation as simple and intuitive as possible, so it doesn't get too overwhelming. To make the video more accessible, I will be skipping some of the more complex technical details in the numerical section. That's the trade-off for simplicity. But if you are curious about details I didn't cover, feel free to leave a comment and we can discuss it further. So let's begin. In the classical three-body problem, we have three masses that interact with each other through gravity. And given their initial positions and velocities, the goal is to predict how these bodies will move over time. Before we dive in, it's worth mentioning that there is a simplified version of the three-body problem, known as a restricted three-body problem. In this version, one or two of the bodies are massive and influence each other gravitationally, while the third body has negligible mass and doesn't affect the other two. A classic example is the Earth-Moon-Sun system, where the Sun is so massive that it can be considered nearly stationary, while the Earth and Moon orbit each other and together they orbit the Sun. Another example is the Earth-Moon asteroid system, where the asteroid's mass is so small that it doesn't significantly influence the Earth or Moon. These restricted cases are very useful in space mission planning and orbital dynamics, but I won't be covering them in this video. Instead, I will focus on the more general case, specifically when all three bodies have equal mass and influence each other equally. This setup leads to much more complex and interesting dynamics, and that's what we'll explore today. Alright, this is the setup of our system. We have a Cartesian coordinate system and three masses in space whose positions are denoted by the position vectors r1, r2, and r3. To derive the equations of motion, we will use Newton's second law and the Newton's law of universal gravitation. The positions r1, r2, and r3 are vector quantities, which means we can express them explicitly in terms of their components. For clarity, I'll assume that the motion of the three bodies is confined to a plane. In other words, their z components will remain zero. And this is the only simplification I'm making. And it's purely for visualization purposes. It doesn't change the fundamental physics of the problem. We will still observe the same complex chaotic behavior and the essential dynamics will be fully preserved. Now Newton's second law states that the mass times the acceleration is equal to the net force acting on that mass. Now let's take a look at the first body and apply the Newton's second law. So the left-hand side of the Newton's second law is simply the mass times the acceleration, where the acceleration is the second derivative of the position vector with respect to time. And on the right-hand side, we have the net force acting on the body. And in our case, for the first body, this will be the sum of the gravitational attraction from the second body and the gravitational attraction from the third body. Similarly, Newton's second law for the second and third bodies can be written in the same way with each one experiencing gravitational forces due to the other two bodies. Now we need the explicit formula for the gravitational forces, which we obtain from the Newton's law of universal gravitation. In general, it can be written in the following compact vector form. For example, in the case of F12 force, we can interpret the formula as follows. The force exerted on body 1 by body 2 is equal to the gravitational constant g multiplied by the product of their masses, divided by the square of the distance between them. This gives the magnitude of the force, the familiar inverse square law. The vector aspect of the force comes from the unit vector pointing from body 1 to body 2. The negative sign here ensures that the force is attractive, meaning it points from body 1 to body 2. So the equations of motion are given here. We have a three second order vector differential equations. And since each position vector has two components, assuming motion is confined to a plane, we can impact each vector equation into its corresponding scalar components. And this gives us a total of six scalar equations, two for each body. But before we do the unpacking, let's first talk about the physical units. G is the gravitational constant, and in the SI system of units, its numerical value is approximately this. That's a very small and inconvenient number to work with in a computer code. When dealing with extremely small or large constants like this, it can introduce numerical instabilities and errors in computer simulations. 
So it would be better if the numerical value of g were something simpler, ideally equal to 1. But can we just set g equals 1? It turns out, yes, we can. Remember, the numerical value of g is only what it is because we measure distance in meters, mass in kilograms, and time in seconds. But these units are arbitrary. We can choose to measure distance, mass, and time in any consistent unit we want. And when we do that, numerical value of g will change accordingly. So what am I going to do is choose a system of units in which the gravitational constant has a numerical value of 1. That way, the equations become much simpler and more numerically stable. This doesn't change the physics, it just changes the units. And at the end of the simulation, you, you can always convert the results back into physical units you want. Alright, we now move on to the numerical solution. To keep things simple, let's start with the first order differential equation with the initial condition. And consider the derivative of a function x with respect to t is defined as the limit as delta t approaches 0 of this function. But how can we evaluate this using a computer? Well, if we keep delta t small enough, we can use this expression as a reasonable approximation. You can also think about this geometrically. This expression here is actually the slope of a second line. And as delta t approaches 0, the second line approaches the tangent line. So by taking the limit, you are essentially turning the second line into the tangent line. And that's what the derivative represents, the slope of the tangent line at a specific point. I actually made a video about this a few months ago, so feel free to check it out if you're interested. The link is in the description. Now we can use this approximation of the derivative to solve the differential equations numerically. Let's plug it into our equation and rearrange the terms. The quantities in this expression are still continuous variables, and to use a computer to solve this, we need to discretize the system. What this means is we take time t, our continuous independent variable, and replace it with a discrete set of points, essentially creating a time grid. So instead of using a continuous variable, we have chosen n discrete values of t, each separated by a step size delta t. For example, t0 is our initial time, then t1 is just t0 plus delta t, t2 is just t0 plus twice delta t, and so on. In general, any point on our time grid can be expressed using the formula tn equals t0 plus n times delta t. And now we can use this time grid to discretize our dependent variable x. For example, x0 is just x evaluated at t0, x1 is just x evaluated at t1, and so on. And we can also evaluate x at time t n plus 1, which gives us just x n plus 1, the value of x at the next time step. And look, we can compare this expression with our approximation of the differential equation, which gives us the following result. So in terms of our new discretized variables, xn and tn, and the time step delta t, we arrive at the following recurrence relation. Let's visualize this geometrically again. Basically, here's what we are doing. We discretize our independent variable t into a finite set of discrete points t0 is the initial time, and x0 is the initial position. And these values must be known beforehand, as they serve as the inputs into the program. Without these, we cannot solve the differential equation uniquely. Now suppose this curve represents the solution to our differential equation. And the program works like this. For n equals 0, the recurrence relation let us calculate the dependent variable x at the next step, x1. For n equals 0, we calculate x2, for n equals 2, we calculate x3, and so on, continuing this process up to n equals capital N minus 1, where we find x capital N. And naturally, choosing a small step size, delta t, leads to a more accurate approximation of the true solution. And this is basically it. This numerical technique I just showed is called Euler's method. Now we could analyze the kind of error introduced by this approximation, numerical stability, whether it's reasonable or not, but I won't go into that here, as it would take us beyond the scope of this video. That said, I want to emphasize that Euler's method is not very robust or highly accurate. It works well enough for some simple problems, but for more complex ones, we need better approximations of the derivative. And one such more precise and sophisticated method is called runge kutta method. Again, I won't go into the details here, but it works in a similar way. 
Both proceed step by step over time grid, but it improves accuracy by using multiple evaluations of the derivative within each time step to get a better approximation. Now, some of you might have noticed that this method applies to first order differential equations, whereas in our three body problem, we are dealing with second order differential equations. However, this isn't a problem because the method can be easily adapted to handle second order equations as well. For example, consider the equation for a driven harmonic oscillator. If we make a substitution by setting the first time derivative of position equal to the velocity, we can transform the single second order differential equation into a system of two first order differential equations. And using this vector notation, we can write the system of equations in a very simple and compact form. And now we simply apply the Euler method or any other numerical method at each step to both of the coupled equations simultaneously. And just to clarify, when I say vector here, I don't mean a physical vector like a force or a velocity vector. Instead, we are using the word vector in a more general mathematical sense, just as a list or a collection of numbers. In physics, a real vector actually represents a single quantity, like velocity or force, with some components in space. And all those components have the same physical units. For example, velocity vector has units of meter per second in all directions. But in this case, we are combining different kinds of quantities, like position in meters and velocity in meters per second, into one single list. And that's technically a vector in math, but not what we usually call vector in physics. Now that we have covered the numerical technique, let's go back and apply to our three-body problem. First, we need to unpack the three vector equations into their scalar components. This gives us six second-order differential equations. Then, by making the following substitutions, we can rewrite the system of six second-order equations as 12 first-order equations. And finally, using the vector notation, we can express the whole system in a compact and elegant form. So here's how the program works. We start with a table of discrete time values. As input, the program requires all the initial conditions. In our case, the initial positions and velocities of all three bodies. And the output is a table of numbers representing the system's evolution over time. The program begins with the initial values and uses them to calculate the next set of values at time t1. Once those are known, it proceeds to compute the values at time equals t2 and continues this process step by step until the end of the simulation. And what we end up with is a large table of numerical values representing the positions and velocities of all three bodies over time. For example, the first column represents the x position of the first body, the second column the y position of the first body, and so on. And that's how we go from the abstract equations of the three-body problem to an actual working numerical simulation. One crucial aspect of this is the initial conditions. These determine exactly how the solution will evolve over time, but picking initial conditions that produce a nice, stable, or visually interesting orbit is far from trivial. In fact, there is a huge body of research devoted entirely to finding sets of initial conditions that lead to interesting or periodic or stable solution. For this video, I used initial conditions from a published paper in Physical Review Letters, link is in the description, as well as from an excellent online source that catalogues periodic three-body orbits. The great thing about science is that my simulation perfectly reproduced the results from those sources. And reproducibility is one of the most important principles in science. This stands in stark contrast to the document Terence Howard provided. In his case, there's simply no way to reproduce the results, because the math doesn't work and the setup isn't defined clearly enough to implement. Thanks for watching and if you have any questions about the simulation, feel free to leave a comment and if you enjoyed the video or learned something new, I would really appreciate if you give it a like and subscribe to the channel. It helps a lot and lets me keep making more content like this. And until next time.